Welcome to the first campus, conversa campus conversation of the spring semester. I'm serving as pinch hitter for my colleague, Dan Mogoloff. I'm Roque Montez, Executive Director of Communications and Media Relations within Public Affairs. And I'm joined by two amazing guests this afternoon who I will introduce shortly, but one quick program note. And that is to say that Campus Conversation is designed for you all to hear from and engage with some of the top university leaders around campus. Having said that, you've, you'll find on your chairs index cards and pencils. Please feel free to jot down your questions, raise your hands, and the student ambassadors uh, will collect them, funnel them to me, and I will put them to the guests who I will now introduce. And I should probably put my glasses on. A mainstay on the Golden Bear bench for over a decade, Sharman Smith was named head coach of the Cal women's basketball team June 21st, 2019. Smith becomes the 10th head coach in Cal women's basketball history after spending the last 12 seasons as an assistant on the Golden Bear staff, including serving as the program's associate head coach since 2012. Cal has had 10 20 win seasons and made nine trips to the NCAA tournament since Smith's arrival in Berkeley in 2007 highlighted by the program's first trip to the Final Four in 2013. Highly regarded throughout the coaching ranks at both the collegiate and professional levels, Smith has played a key role in building Cal into one of the premier programs on the West Coast, handling duties from recruiting and scheduling to alumni engagement and campus equity and inclusion. She has served on the Women's Basketball Coaches Association Board of Directors and was hired in April 2019 to serve as an assistant coach for the WNBA's New York Liberty. A St. Louis native, Smith was a star player for Stanford from 1993 to 97, helping the Cardinal to three NCAA Final Fours and three Pac-10 titles. A four-year letter winner at Stanford, she earned her bachelor's and master's degrees in civil and environmental engineering from the school. Following her collegiate playing career, Smith joined the professional ranks in the ABL from 1997 to 98 as a member of the Portland Power and played three years in the WNBA along with one year in the Swedish Basketball League. She began her coaching career in 2003 as an assistant coach at Boston College where she spent one season before joining Tara Vanderveer's coaching staff at Stanford. After three years, Smith left the farm for Berkeley and joined the Golden Bear staff for the 27, I'm sorry, 2007-2008 season. Welcome. Mark Fox, a veteran coach who guided teams at Nevada and Georgia in mul to multiple postseason bursts during the course of his career, was named the men's basketball coach, head basketball coach at Cal on March 29, 2019. Fox compiled a 123-43 record in five seasons, leading Nevada from 2005 to 2009, a run that included four conference championships, three invitations to the NCAA tournament, and two trips to the CBI tournament. He later served as head coach at Georgia for nine seasons from 2010 to 2018 and amassed a 163-133 mark, leading the Bulldogs to a pair of NCAA tournaments and three national invitation tournaments. With a career record of 286-176, he has averaged more than 20 wins per season over 14 years. Outside of coaching, Fox is a former chair of the NCAA Men's Basketball Rules Committee and member of the NCAA Division I Men's Basketball Ethics Coalition. He has also raised nearly $1 million for Coaches versus Cancer. Fox played collegiately at Garden City Community College in Kansas under former Nevada head coach Jim Carey and then lettered two seasons at Eastern New Mexico where he was a first team academic all-conference selection in 1991. Fox earned his bachelor's degree in physical education from Eastern New Mexico in 1991 and a master's degree in sports administration, sports psychology from Kansas in 1996. Originally from Garden City, Kansas, he and his wife Cindy have two children, Parker and Olivia. Welcome, Coach. Thank you. So why don't we jump right in. Coach Smith, you've been on campus for some time, but new in your role, and Coach Fox, obviously new in your role. Can you talk about some of the early observations that you've seen, aha moments, learning moments, in the last, oh, say, just under a year or so here? Being that you're really new, I think you should take that one first. <laughs> well, uh, obviously, um, 
Coach Smith has been here for over a decade, so she, she knows her way around campus, and, and uh, I'm still trying to figure out where to park. But, um, <laughs> you know, there's been a lot of, um, there's a lot of new things, a lot of newness uh, in my life right now, and uh, this, is a, this is a wonderful place. Uh, it's a complex place, as, as most of us know. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, 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 we've gotten off to a great start, but certainly um, as, as you come to someplace new and you, you uncover, um, I, I like to say this, usually when you have a job interview, um, they tell you how great it is, and then on the first couple of days, you, they tell you all the problems, and, um, and then you try and figure out how to, to, how to, to make it all work. But uh, in, in my conversations with Jim Knowlton, our athletic director, before I came, he was very candid about our situation, and, and uh, so there haven't been a lot of curveballs uh, since I arrived. Uh, just just uh, lots of work to be done. Okay. Thoughts? Uh, it's just been really um, great, the amount of support and excitement that I've felt from people with my return. Uh, I, I didn't necessarily expect it, and I, I'm just really appreciative that people have made me feel um, really welcome coming back and being here at Cal. Fantastic. So let's talk about priorities, right? Um, I'll start with you, Coach Smith. The program in the last few years, we, let's just be candid, because we're going to be candid here in this conversation all among family, has struggled a little bit. Talk about what the priorities are for you moving forward. There's a lot of days I wake up and wish I was Coach Smith. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> there's no secret. The, the, the program has struggled. I mean, there's, I mean the, the one thing about an athletics, I mean, it's, there's measurables. And um, we had the two worst seasons in the history of our, our university. And so uh, obviously we're, we're starting from, from ground zero and we have to, we have to build forward. And, and, um, and you know, for, for me, um, it, it's about a daily investment in doing things the right way. But there's, there's a lot of things, obviously, to, to, to sell. There's a great foundation here, starting with an, a, a, just a world-class university. And um, that's the first thing that we tell every recruit, is that this is the number one institution in the world. And um, I have a very good friend of mine who's a toilet salesman. And um, he, um, he told me when I took the job, he says, you need to buy a globe. And, uh, I said, what do you mean? He says, listen, he says, everyone has to go to the bathroom, so my sales are easy. He says, your sales are going to be hard because your program has struggled. He says, buy a globe and put it in the center of your conference room. And so when you meet with a kid and his family, you can say, listen, pick any spot in the world and there's not a better school. And so I did. I bought a globe and it's in our conference room. <laughs> and, and, uh, and that's great advice from someone who's, who sells what he sells. You've got some interesting friends, coach. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Kelly McElhaney from the, from the Haas Business School was just speaking, and I was listening to her. She said, go through your personal board of directors and list the eight or ten people that, that you go to for, for, you're for counsel. And, and then after you list those, those people, look at all the different characteristics of those people. And do they, are they all like you or are they different? And every one of mine were different. And, and so I felt fortunate that I, I was, when she said that's what she said is ideal, I felt fortunate that that's what I have in my life. But I, I, I do have a lot of uh, good people that, that, can, that can give me advice. Absolutely. Coach Smith? Uh, you know, we've had some success in the past, uh, but it, it definitely is a point in our program right now where we are reloading, so to speak, and, 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 and in some ways building things from scratch. We lost... Um, four starters and our sixth player. Um, you know, just on Sunday against Oregon, a top team in the country, I had one player in the game um, that has played significant minutes before. So we are a really young group and a very inexperienced group. And it has been a ton of fun because we are a group that's committed to one another and we're a group that understands the value of being at Cal and what that means. And, um, you know, to, to Coach's point, it's, it's building on that and having people who want to be at the number one public institution in the world uh, and want to be a part of your culture and what you're building. And, and that's what we're doing right now, just finding people who are willing to buy into what it is that we're building. <laughs> So let's talk about that a little bit. You, you called it reloading, and I'm guessing you're talking about recruitment on some level. So can we talk a little bit about what goes into that process? Because quite frankly, to come to Cal and play, we're not specifically focused on all athletics. This is about academics 
as well. So what does that ideal recruit look like? I think if, if you can't find the recruit that values the degree, um, it, it's, it's not going to turn out well. They, they have to understand um, that this is a, a, a place that's about academic excellence. And we provide the academic resources and support for our student athletes to be successful. But they have to want to be a student athlete and, and not just an athlete. And, and if we don't have that match, then it's not a good fit and we move on for sure. Well, I, I, I think this is a life-changing place. Um, and you know, obviously the student athletes that, that we recruit to come here have to, have to be able to look further down the line than just the next four, five, six, seven years of their life. Um, in, in, in our sport, so many kids are, are, are of the belief that they're gonna make money playing professional basketball and it, with social media, they can all make themselves famous in their own little galaxy. Um, and we have to have young people who understand that, that even if that part of their life comes true, that there's 30 or 40 years of something else. And our responsibility is to prepare them for that something else. And, and at, 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 in Berkeley, they, they have to understand that, that that's, that's part of the deal. And, and fortunately, I think my values align with what this campus stands for. And if, if we can find kids that buy into that, then we'll have, a, we'll have some success stories. Okay, so a question from the audience, and it sort of builds on uh, the responses from both of you coaches, and it is, what is your advice for young scholar athletes uh, aspiring to compete at the collegiate level at a place like UC Berkeley? Well, I, I would say that, that my advice for someone that wants to compete at, at UC Berkeley is that, is that competition has no prejudice. Uh, it doesn't care that, 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 that we're playing for Cal or that you're playing for whatever school. Um, when, when the scoreboard turns on, competition has no prejudice. It doesn't care what color you are, what, what religion you are. There's no, there's, no, there's no prejudice in competition. And so um, I think my advice to them would be that in preparation for competition, you have to do everything humanly possible to give yourself the best chance to be successful because uh, it's, it's, it's all the work that's done prior to that scoreboard coming on that often separates who's successful and who's not. Any thoughts? Okay. Following up on an earlier question, please describe your recruiting philosophy. How does it change here at Cal? Uh, you know, in my coaching experience, I've uh, been at high academic institutions, so that there hasn't been much of a shift. And, You'll always find me coaching at high academic institutions because that's something that I value. Um, I, I feel like if I'm coaching young women, um, we need to be preparing them for life after their sport. Um, while you know, Mark's young men can make millions and millions of dollars if they happen to play professional basketball, uh, we've seen the struggles of WNBA players trying to get the salary increases and having to go to Russia and China and South Korea in order to make money. And I don't think that anyone should rely on that. So um, the, the focus uh, in recruiting is making sure that they understand we're preparing you for what's going to come after Cal and this degree sets you up for that in a way that you can't even imagine. And I speak to the recruits in terms of my own personal experience, right? Um, Having a degree from Stanford has definitely impacted my life in a very positive way. And I think a Cal degree has that same type of impact. And so we're looking for you know, those student athletes that understand that and want that, and then have the commitment and the drive and the skill set and the talent to help us compete in the Pac-12 and get to that national level where we are winning championships. Can you talk a little bit about the value that intercollegiate athletics brings to Berkeley? Well, Coach Smith has been here longer than I, so she may have a, a better understanding of the environment. I, I know when I was hired, I had an initial press conference, and right before the press conference, I was educated on when to use the phrase Cal and when to use the term UC Berkeley. And, and I still, I mean, I, I had to go to junior college, okay? So um, I don't know if I'm smart enough to understand it, but 
my own personal opinion is, is I don't understand why it's perceived to be two different places. This is, this is one university. And the first thing that we tell any, any student athlete that's on our team that we're, or that we're recruiting is that this is the number one institution in the world. And, and we use that to our advantage. And I think that the, the sense of community within a, a university um, is, I mean, communities, it's, we're about being, you know, representing one place. And so I think that when done right, when done right, that, that um, athletics can, can enhance a university and it can, it can bring a sense of great community. It can bring great publicity. It can bring notoriety to things other than your athletic teams uh, if it's done right. And um, the important thing is, is, that, is that, that we have to do it right. And, and, um, and I think that, that um, as I get to know uh, life in Berkeley, I think there's a lot of coaches across our athletic department um, that are doing it right, and um, and if we can have the success um, that that we need that, that we want to have that, that on a on a national stage, I think it can, I think it can really be uh, a benefit to the school. So I have a question here that specifically says, should your athletes get paid? Why or why not? But before I go into that sort of specific focus, let's take a step back and talk about the sort of momentous change that the NCAA uh, ruled in, I guess it was late October, that essentially said that athletes, and I'll quote here, unanimously are permitted to, uh, students are permitted to participate in athletics, the opportunity to benefit from the use of their name, image, and likeness in a manner consistent with the collegiate model. Um, can you, let's talk first about the implications of that. Obviously, actually the NCAA is meeting in Anaheim of all places this week. I don't think that there is going to be a vote this week, but and in fact, they're still collecting information as I understand it through um, April or so. So we're still a couple months off before there's anything concrete and maybe still further than that. But I'm just curious to hear upon hearing that news, um, what, what, what are the implications for a D1 school like Cal as this rolls forward? All right, I'll take it. <laughs> I, I, I'll let her, I'm going to talk after her because I got some comments okay. yeah. there too. But go, uh, go ahead, Coach. I think you know there there are a ton of implications, and you can look at this a number of ways. Um, should student athletes get paid? Well, some might argue our student athletes are in full scholarship. Aren't they getting paid in some ways with that? Um, I think the NCA has made great strides in helping student athletes and understanding that. Just paying for you know, a, a place to live and my tuition doesn't necessarily mean that I can survive at an institution. And so you know, if, if any of you have watched the Fab Five documentary, um, this is where a lot of this stems from, and that you know, those student athletes were, they had a scholarship, but they didn't have money to get food or go see a movie or do something like that um, outside of you know, what was given to pay for being at that institution. And so um, we've developed the cost of attendance that's added to the scholarship that takes into consideration, yes, people need to be able to have enough money to eat and maybe have money to fly home and see their family and such. So we've made some strides with that. Um, when we talk about name, image, and likeness, uh, I, I think it's different depending on what sport you coach. So. Um, football players being able to sell their jersey and make money off of that is different than my student athlete just wanting to post on social media, hey, I'm a Cal basketball player, and if your kid wants basketball lessons for $30 a, month, or $30 a session, I'd be open to teaching your young kid how to play basketball. So there are a lot of different things that you can't just lump in to one category. Right now, my student athlete couldn't do that, and a football player can't make money off of his jersey. Which one are we trying to allow to happen right now? And if we're going with um, you know, the whole whammy with it, and then we have to address how it affects individual sports. So who's paying for it? If we're now saying that athletic institutions are going to be competing for recruits by saying, we will provide this amount of money if you come play for us. 
well, we'll provide this amount of money. Well, we know at Cal, we're gonna be in trouble. So there are a lot of things that need to be discussed, need to be worked through. As a coach of a female sport, if athletics is now giving more money to football, that's not gonna to come to women's basketball or women's sports. Are we eliminating smaller men's sports in order to account for Title IX, right? Um, out of the 100 professional athletes right now, highest paid, 100 highest paid athletes, how many are female? One, Serena. Serena, that's it. So I just think there's a lot of discussion that still needs to be had around what the intentions are, what are we exactly trying to accomplish, and then what are the repercussions of doing those things? Thank you, thank you. Coach Fox. Uh, she, she made a lot of great points, and, and I would just add that with name, image, and likeness, um, you know, it's, it's the can of worms that we don't quite know what kind of worms are inside. Um, and uh, I think that, that um, you know, having some, some level of, of uh, consistency uh, from state to state was going to be important. There's a lot of states that have introduced new laws that, that, uh, that are going to make this, um, you know, uh, I think possible. Uh, but if, if our state has a law that's, that's, that's restrictive in one way and our competitor has one that's, 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 that's maybe less restrictive, it, it can provide an, an advantage for, for, for that, that schools in that state. Uh, I think the other thing to look at, too, is that is we're trying to stay away, from, and, I, and I fully support, you know, us trying to make sure that we maximize what these kids can get. Um, but but we are we're we're not becoming professional sport. But but unless this is managed just right, we're we're going to enter the professional sports world. And um, there's some, you know, in my previous life, I coached in a, in a league where there's not there's some states with no professional sports. And so who are companies in those states going to go to for endorsements if there's not? The, the Oakland A's and the San Francisco Giants and the Warriors and the, and the 49ers and everybody else, they're, they're going to go to the college kids. And so um, I think it has to be, you know, um, you know, regulated might be a little bit of a strong word, but there has to be some consistency on how this is implemented uh, once, once it comes to fruition, because I think it could, really, it could really tilt the competitive balance in college athletics. And I think that, that um, you know, we have to, in, in professional sports, um, you know, there, there's, um, you know, it's, it's not everybody, um, you know, everybody gets the same. You know, it's, it's just not how it is. Um, and, um, and there's a reason that the, that the best players make the most money. And, and um, if, if, if we provide um, some, some, some leeway uh, in the, it, without, the right, without the right guidelines and name, image, and likeness, then I think we're going to change the entire landscape of college athletics. Is that a bad thing? I think overturning the apple cart could be a very dangerous thing uh, for everybody because I think once it's upside down, we're going to lose the opportunity to educate so many kids, and um, and we have to make sure that, that this is that this is implemented correctly. And I'm not sure correctly is 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 the right word. There has to be an appropriate way for this progress to be made. Thank you, Coach Smith. I can't have you on the stage here and not talk about gender inequity. I just read recently about um, the union in the WNBA, which of course you played in and coached for a bit with the New York Liberty, um, finally decided that they should perhaps raise salaries for the players in addition to offering other uh, opportunities for them to A, not only make money, but uh, lifestyle. Um, we heard about, uh, was it Skylar Diggins who played essentially the entire season pregnant because she didn't get support from her team. We've heard many of the players talk about um, their paltry salaries. Can I sort of pick your brain a little bit about what you're telling your student athletes who may or may not be interested in aspiring to the WNBA and what that looks like? And, and really, what your, your sort of message is overall, not only for the, the, the athletes, but for students here, because you both represent the campus in that way. Um, what, what, are, what are the messages you're telling them around uh, gender equality or lack thereof in the spaces that you are? I mean, uh, I think we have a long way to go towards gender equality in our nation. Uh, I, I think we know this. Um, I, I'm really proud of, um, you know, the, what the WNBA players were able to do 
um, with the collective bargaining agreement. I think there are some great steps forward with that. Proud of Alasia Clarendon as you know, being a, a part of that uh, group. And we, we also have, to, we're also realists and we understand that you know, LeBron James is making a lot more money than Elena Deladon or Sue Bird. And I don't think that there's a WNBA player that thinks they should be making as much as LeBron James. And I think somehow, sometimes there's a disconnect and people don't understand what Neko Gumake and Leja Clarendon and that group are actually fighting for. And it's more the things that you talked about. You know, if we're traveling for a playoff game, you know, are, are we commercial and we're, you know, economy where NECA's knees are up against the seat and she has to travel day of, or are we making accommodations so that we can put the best product on the floor so that we can have a better fan base and we can, um, you know, have more revenue, revenue coming in to um, support the sport. And so those are the things that I think we're really um, address in the collective bargaining agreement in addition to increasing salaries. All right. Any thoughts on that, Coach Fox? You know, she mentioned airline travel. I, I mean, as a taller person, um, you know, it, it's a seat 37F is no not very comfortable for me. It's not gonna be, it's not gonna be comfortable for a six six women's player or a six ten men's player. But but um, there's still a lot of work obviously to be done in, in that in that area. How are we ensuring our student athletes reach their academic aspirations? How are we balancing school life, athletic life? What does that look like? I think that starts in the recruiting process. Um, you know, it's, it's the first thing that I tell uh, the young women that I speak to on the phone. Hey, this is the number one public institution. Like, that's a great thing, right? You, 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 you get to set yourself up to have the best of both worlds. And when you're here, we're gonna support you completely so that you can be successful. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of, of where we stand academically right now. We, we just had our best academic sem semester um, in, in the past 13 years. Um, and it's, it's what we're going to emphasize. This is the most important thing for a young woman. The WNBA is phenomenal. I played in the league. I, I love that experience. Um, but it is, it is not the number one priority. Uh, as Mark mentioned, those 30 years after uh, is what you have to be concerned with, and that's why this degree is so important. You know, I, I think the student athletes are, are different in this way. Is, is that the demands that that they have to that they have to to deal with are, are different than a normal student in 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 some ways. Uh, I think with with coaches' sport and my sport, the, the one thing that our kids encounter is that they have to travel um, both semesters, and they have to travel in the middle of the week. And so there's missed class time that's required. And uh, it's challenging, and, and the, the, the amount of, of, of energy that they put in to, um, to their sport is, is high. So I think uh, our responsibility to them to provide unbelievable support so they can be successful is, is critical because you know, they came to become educated young people, and we have to help them do that. And, uh, and sometimes, uh, just by the nature of, of, of the sport, it, it's harder because they're gonna miss some class that, that, uh, that they wouldn't miss if they were a non-athlete. And so I think it's our responsibility to provide as much support in that area as we can and, um, and try and be extremely organized uh, about um, our approach. And um, you know, I think it's an area where we can always, we can always be better. And for those who do aspire to the NBA, and, and actually you, Charmin, in a, a previous conversation you shared with me that um, women have to go to college for a couple of years, or at least be a certain age before they can enter the NBA, but for men that is a little different. Should college, I guess is the question, should college be a requirement before entering either the NBA and so most certainly, obviously, the WNBA? You know, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's fair for us to say to somebody that you have to go to college for one year or three years um, before you can you know, have a right to make money with your talents. I think that's an individual decision. I think that decision has to be made with great education and I think oftentimes there's kids that leave school early that, that don't have um, the proper education on what the reality of the situation may be. Um, obviously, in, in basketball right now, there's the, the rule called the one and done. That's getting ready to be eliminated. 
um, which means some kids will be allowed to go out of high school. That also means some kids may come to college for one year and leave. Uh, so you're still going to have p potentially some one and done players. Uh, I think that you have to find young people that, that are committed to uh, becoming educated. And, and um, because, um, you know, I just I actually had a young man speak to our team the other night who had played for me uh, for two years at, at, um, at Georgia. Now he's playing for the Lakers. And, and um, he had two years of college education. And, and, and two years is, is, is not four. Um, but he chose to leave early, and he's made millions of dollars. And, and, and he said to our team that I, I need to finish my education. And, and here's a guy that's, that's, that's uh, had a lot of success on the court. And, and so I think that as you look at the, the one and done world, um, you have to find young people that understand the value of education. And we have to do a great job selling the value of, of becoming educated. And I think that's an area where uh, in society in general, universities have to do a better job uh, marketing just the value of becoming a college-educated individual. How many of those players who, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just think it's important that we're careful not to judge student athletes in a different way than we judge other students, right? Because there are a lot of people who don't finish college and they go on to, you know, own companies that are extremely successful. They, they you know, they, they have startups and, and other ways in which they are going to navigate through the world that doesn't necessarily include four years at a college institution. And I don't see the same judgment placed there. So I just think we need to really check ourselves and be mindful um, to that. That, that, that your response actually almost negates my next question, which, was, which is fine, which is how many of those students who do uh, leave after a year or so, how often are they coming back? And are there processes, processes in place here to make that easy or accessible? I, I know for our program, any woman who does not have their degree and needs to come back and get it, we want to fully support them in any way possible um, because it, it is extremely important. I, I do think those decisions have to be made um, you know, by that individual and, and their support group, right? Because we don't understand everyone's financial situation, um, their family situation. We don't know necessarily what goes into the types of decisions that people have to make. And um, I, I know I want everyone to get that degree. It's really important to me. Um, but you know, that might not be the best thing um, for someone in, in Mark's program. Okay. Thoughts? You know, I, I think that, that um, we, we do provide the opportunity for these young men to come back and, and finish their uh, education, which, which, is, is, which is our responsibility to them. And uh, I think it's a wonderful uh, thing that, that, that we do. And, and um, you know, obviously um, every situation is unique. You also don't know when a kid's thinking about leaving, the crystal ball is, okay, how much money will you make? Will, will you even be successful? And, and if you do make it, how much money will you make? And, and um, so obviously allowing those that leave the opportunity to come back, I think, is, is, uh, is certainly important. Uh, a couple of questions from the audience. How do you take a group of high school superstars and make them a cohesive team ego? And then, by the way, Charmin, always love your shoes. <laughs> well, uh, are you looking at me? Um, uh, you know, I, I think that you have to, you have to, um, you know, every, every individual that we recruit usually was the best player on their high school team or some team that they were on prior to. And, and, um, and you have to get them to, to buy into the cause of, of something bigger than themselves. And, and uh, oftentimes that's harder than, than, uh, than they want it to be. Um, oftentimes, um, the, some of the people in their ear don't r really realize that, that, uh, that they're no longer the star. And, but um, as people's roles change, um, I try to educate them on the fact that, that um, everybody's role may be of a different size, but everybody has value. Everybody has value. And, um, and they have to, I think, if you can get them to understand that, it makes that transition easier. Uh, but it's, it's, it's certainly one of the great challenges of, of, of coaching a team sport is getting every member of the team to sacrifice for the, for the cause of the team. I agree. Okay. In what ways are sports psychologists used in women's and men's basketball? 
I, I think it's becoming um, you know, more and more popular. Um, it, it's, it's a necessity um, for our program. We have a sports psychologist that spends a lot of time with the team um, and is available for our student athletes um, whenever they need. Uh, you know, this, it's, it's just a, a, it's difficult being 18 to 22 year old, you know, at, at times, and there's a lot that they're trying to navigate and they don't, all, they don't always know how to deal with everything. And uh, I, I encourage my student athletes to reach out um, and speak to a sports psychologist or even a psychologist in general, um, depending on, on what's going on. Whether it's, you know, dealing with sports performance issues, I was the star, now I don't play. Um, or, you know, sometimes it's just, I'm trying to cope with being away from home and having a lot of, uh, you know, things that I've, I've never had to feel before in, in this new environment and, and how do I handle all of that. And our philosophy is we provide the resources, we make sure they have the access, and we normalize all of that so that um, they don't feel as though, you know, there's something different or something wrong with them if they have to ask for help. Mental health uh, has come to a forefront of, of just how it was ignored for many years. And I think the one thing that we've, we've tried to do with, with our team, I have a master's degree in sports psychology, and as I was going through um, the, the, the course load, I kept thinking back to my high school coach and all the things that he did, and I thought, was he a coach or was he a sports psychologist? Because he essentially wore both hats, and I think I think we, we do wear a lot of those hats uh, as coaches. But there are all, there are also issues, whether it be in sports specific or just their personal lives, where outside help is, is necessary. And that's one of the great things about Cal is that we have great resources and encourage that. What does a day in life of a student uh, student athlete at Cal look like? It's very busy. <laughs> uh, you know from. For, for, for our student athletes getting up in the morning, we try to encourage them to get something in their stomach <laughs> so that they're ready to go when they come um, when it comes time for practice. Uh, but taking care of their classes in the morning, then arriving early for treatment, rehab, um, with sports performance or you know athletic trainer, mm -hmm. then the the three hours of commitment to us on the court or in the film room, and then their rehab or treatment following those three hours and then back to maybe another class that they have in the evening to then their tutor sessions at night and then prepping for the next day. So it, it's a full day um, and, and they make sacrifices to be a student athlete in order to do it at a high level. What kinds of sacrifices? Um, you know, we talk about the academic, the athletic, the social, like sometimes you can't have all three of them at once. So there might be periods in which um, during the season they're not as social as they'd like to be, right? Because you never want to compromise the academics and we hope that they're you know, showing up as best they can for us uh, athletically. So sometimes it's like I hang out with my teammates, you know, and I, and I have some time and I, I don't know what they do, FaceTime with mom and friends and such. And then, you know, it's time for bed. And, and um, you know, we'll, we'll see you after this big weekend. We'll catch up on a day off. Um, but, but their weeks are, are really, really full during the season. And that's to Coach Fox's point, like basketball, it's both semesters. It's not just one semester. You're in season for pretty much the whole academic year. And um, what they do is, is really impressive, and they're very special individuals to be able to succeed as a student athlete. I met this morning with a young man who, um, just to review his daily schedule for for um, for the week, and and um, as as we were preparing to do this yesterday, um, one of my young staff members had put together a, a calendar, and and this is when your study hall is, this is when this class is, this is when tutoring is, and. And I said, well, you, you've left one thing out. And he says, what's that? I said, you know, he has to eat at some point. <laughs> I mean, he has to eat. And, um, and so life as a student athlete is, is um, I tell our team, you, you really have time for two things. You have time to, to, um, to be a student, and you have time to, to, 
if you want to be excellent, to, to, be, a, to be a player. And, and there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into it. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that, that um, it's, a very, it's a very demanding uh, um, endeavor for these young people to, uh, to play basketball to, in the Pac-12 and to, to be students here. It's a, it's, a, it's a very demanding endeavor. And we have to be aware as the leaders of these young people to build in time for um, that they get proper sleep which is one of the first things that they sacrifice um, to make sure that, that, they're, that they eat correctly and that they also have time to decompress because that's important in their mental health to be able to succeed in the classroom or as an athlete is that they have time to decompress. Finding that time often means sacrificing some of our time just to make sure we have some balance. Thank you. Speaking of leadership, I've got a question from the floor. A lot of times managers are asked to look to coaches for tips on how to inspire and unite people. To that end, what's your advice to those of us who do lead people but not on a court? Um, you know, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to tell you one little quick story. Uh, years ago, I was, I was getting ready to play a, a game. It was the last home game of the regular season, and we were playing the University, University of Kentucky, who was undefeated. And they were trying to become the first team that was undefeated in, in like 40 years. And, and, um, and um, so I, I just, I got the phone number for the former Super Bowl champion coach, Bill Parcells, who I did not know. And so I just took a chance and I called him. And I said, coach, I said, you don't know me, but I introduced myself. And he said, what do you want? I said, well, I'm, I'm getting ready to play this game. I, I just would like to ask your advice on what do you, think I should tell my team? And he says, okay, I'm gonna ask you one question first. I said, well, what's that? He says, do you think you can win? I said, well, yeah, I think we can win. And so he's okay, well, this is what I would tell your team. And um, he went on to say that as a leader of young people, he says, your responsibility is that you give them an opportunity and a chance to be successful every single time. And, and, and so that has stuck with me so that in anything that we do, even though if we design something in practice, it's going to be very difficult. There has to be the opportunity for them to be successful. And we have to devise a way, even with our team now, re, you know, inheriting what we did and knowing that we have a lot of challenges in front of us, they have to see that in every game, there's a pathway for them to be successful. And, uh, and I think that my advice to anyone that leads anybody is that you have to show um, uh, anyone in the organization that there is a pathway for this to for this to happen and uh, it may be difficult it may be uphill it may be harder than you ever imagined but it is possible great I, I agree with that I, I think um, you know we were just in a situation this weekend or over the past two weeks actually where we played four games against four top ten opponents right we're not ranked we're not receiving votes and um, in, in trying to give them ways in which they could see we could be successful, um, it wasn't necessarily, this is how we beat this team. It was, these are the things that we are focusing on in this game against this team. And, and we set um, goals that I thought were reasonable and expectations that I felt they could buy into and get excited about. And our number one goal for that two-week period was to stick together, because I knew it was going to be challenging. Um, and when we got in the locker room following the last game where we lost by 50 points, 50 points, I looked at the board and I was able to say, but we did this, and we did this, and what was the number one thing we were supposed to do this weekend? And they said, stick together. And I said, did we do that? Yes, we're together. We're really happy to be on this team. And then one of the players says, you good coach? I was like, I'm great, I'm great, you know, because that was the goal and, and that was success during that time. And I said, we're writing down names and we're gonna remember this, right? And eventually we'll be back there where it's not small goals, it is like, this is how we win, this is how we beat this team. But for us right now, it's about presenting ways for us to feel good and know that we're growing and we're building. And I think that applies to any organization or any group having, trying to have success. 
So let's turn that question inward, right? Um, you're both sort of rebuilding, reloading, et cetera. How do you all keep it up, keep it together in that space? I have really good, a really good staff um, and a really good support staff that's just, it's just made things a lot easier for me, right? Where I can just focus in on how do we get better. I think that's key. Um, and just really, being authentic and honest about what it is that I'm de demanding of our student athletes. So I, I, I've said to them, your best is enough. Your best is enough. We probably don't have a WNBA draft pick right now, and you know, currently. I hope that some of them develop into that. But right now, on our roster, um, there's no one projected, right? Um, part of this because we have four freshmen. But anyways. Um, we are just extremely young, and if you look on paper, um, we don't have the same that some other teams in our conference do. And I've told them, I really don't care. We have what we need, and we have people that want to be here. And this is where we are right now, and as long as you are doing your best and giving me your all, that's enough. So when I get frustrated or discouraged, um, I turn that question to myself. Are you giving your best to the team? Are you doing all that you can do? And I've been able to say, yes, I am. So then my best has to be enough as, as well. Coach Fox? Well, I think on a deeper level, um, what, what, what maybe motivates me is that I, I grew up in a small town in Kansas that is like, I mean, you can't see the end of the world from there, but maybe it's so flat. You know, it's, it's um, um, at the time it was hours from an airport, hours from a shopping mall. I mean, there wasn't a lot of opportunity. I didn't even know the world existed. Um, and um, so when I was a high school student, there were some guys that were older than me that, that saw for some reason that I had a chance in life. And, um, and, uh, and they, they protected me from all kind of things looking back. And uh, I, I, it just, I mean, it, it, it brings just pure love to my heart to think about how they, they just looked out for me. And so I think it was, it was 45 years ago now or something like that, 35 years ago, I got this keychain. I got a laundry pin in high school that we used to, to put our dirty socks on and throw it in the, in the washer. And uh, so I've carried this laundry pin every day since 1985 as my keychain as a reminder of those people who made sure I had an opportunity. And so uh, I, don't, I don't get discouraged um, because I, I have great belief that our program is going to be successful. That doesn't mean I don't get really ticked off because um, I, I, think it's, I think it's every game is winnable, as I mentioned, um, and I'm very driven and determined. Uh, but the, the uh, source of that determination and drive um, goes back to the many, many people who have really put their arms around me to give me the opportunity. Thank you. I've got a question on recruitment, and bear with me, please. Uh, I'm going to sort of summarize if I can. How are major schools in the European, European Union or South, America, South American nations recruiting, and what can we learn from those systems, and can we adopt their processes? I think I've summarized that accurately. I hope I have. We have several European kids on our team, and there's not an athletic program. One of the kids that we have is a seven-foot freshman from Germany, and he's here because he wanted to get an education. There's not a, there's not a basketball team attached to a university in his home country, so there really isn't recruitment there. Um, there are club teams, um, and kids can play on club teams as amateurs or they can choose to go all in and, and, and sacrifice their amateur eligibility and become young professionals. And so it's really not a model that we can take a lot from as in, in, in regards to recruitment. Quick side question, when do coaches start building files on players? On prospective players? Yeah. <laughs> We've known about players as early as junior high, seventh, eighth grade we know about. And how do you come to know about them? Well, now social media helps a lot. <laughs> but um, prior to, it would just be a coach saying, hey, I got this young kid. You need to come see her. She's going to be really special. 
And then, you know, we make an effort to see him in club basketball, summer ball, and such. Okay. Same? Yeah, it's insane. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I watched a kid that was 14 years old play the other day. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's very early when it starts. Um, and obviously, there's, there's a lot of development in young people from, from that stage to before they can walk onto our campus. So there's a lot of evaluation that you must do in their, you know, in their character, their game, their physical, their physical skills, in their, their transcript, and, and uh, it's it's um, it's a it's the process starts very early and probably too early. Coach Smith, you mentioned that at present there probably aren't some uh, uh, players who are projected to go into the. WNBA at this point, and I don't know, Coach Fox, if that is the same assessment that you would have, but my question is, what are the odds of going pro, period? Isn't there a commercial on that? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just gonna, I mean, the odds of going, like, I mean, yeah. you can be a professional, okay, and you might get like one taste of the, uh, of, of the ice cream, okay, but to actually have a career, those odds are next to impossible, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, they're next, I mean, you, you know, that. I think I've had 12 kids play in the NBA, okay? And some of them have made, you know, tons of money. But there's also guys who've played just a little bit and they didn't get life-changing and generation-changing money. Um, the odds of kids becoming that player are very slim, no matter what school you attend. The odds of becoming that, that guy that has generational wealth mm -hmm. is very, very slim. And um, now the odds of any kid playing professional basketball at some level, because there's so many opportunities in Europe and everywhere else, there's the developmental league with the NBA. There's there's minor leagues all over the place. Sure, a lot of guys can have a chance to do that, and say that they were a pro, but to actually make an amount of money that that changes your life, those odds are slim. We have a roster size issue as well in the number of teams. I mean, you're, you're talking less than 150 people who can say they play in the WNBA. There are way more talented women's basketball players than that. Like the, the league needs to grow. There, the, there need to be more teams um, in, in cities, right? And we need the roster size to, roster size to increase because- Is that on the horizon? Um, you know, I, I didn't get through all of the collective bargaining agreement to know if roster size was on that. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I know I'm waiting for the Warriors to step up <laughs> and, and, and get a team. You know, I think the Bay Area has been an amazing place for women's basketball. Mm -hmm. I think the fan support is here. And, and, and I think it'd be a great city to have a WNBA team. Okay, fantastic. So just with a couple minutes left to go, I had a couple of quick questions. And one is that you mentioned um, attendance and size and, and desire for a team. Um, one can't help but notice the disparity in numbers between the folks who come to the men's basketball games here and the, and the women's. Um, can we talk a little bit about what might be behind that and how we might be able to change that? At, at the end of every game, jump on the mic and give an impassioned plea for folks to continue to support the team um, and those kinds of things. But, but what will it take and why the difference? Yeah, you know, um, I, I'm not sure what, what, the, what the reason is behind that. Um, it, when, when we had our, our Final Four team here and, the, you know, the most winning we've ever done here at Cal, we averaged 2,500 fans. And, and the men weren't going to the Final Four, they were getting more, right? So, so, so there's something going on there. Um, you know, I, I, I want Coach Fox to have, have it sold out. I want him to have as many fans as possible. I think the young men who are working their butts off on that court deserve to be supported by the institution, um, by the students, by the community. And I also think the young women who are giving their all on the court for us every night deserve to be supported. And, and I don't know how we get that going for both programs. Um, you know, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna win more games. I think, I think that helps. Uh, but also when we were winning more games than anyone, we still didn't have the fan support. And no theories? I'm just gonna stay really positive and say <laughs> it's going to come okay. and it's, okay. it's going to happen. Uh, I'm just thankful for the people that come and support our kids, and, and uh, if, if we play the game the right way and, and um, continue to grow and develop, that part will take care of itself.
right. So I'm going to give you two the last word, but before uh, we dismiss, just wanted to promo the upcoming uh, campus conversation, which will be February 24th, when we'll have Chief Innovation and Entrepreneurship Officer Rich Lyons. Final question, what will be your legacy? I, I don't necessarily want to have a legacy. I want the story about Cal basketball during my tenure to be about our teams and about our players. Um, it, shouldn't, it really shouldn't be about the coach. And, uh, and so I, I hope that, that when, when my time ends, hopefully a long time down the road, <laughs> that, that, that this is about what these young people did and, and that should be the entire story. I, I think that's a great answer. I think uh, for me, you know, I, I would encourage you all to um, read a piece that I wrote yesterday surrounding uh, Martin Luther King's uh, birthday. And for, for me, this opportunity to be a head coach here at Cal is about um, empowering young women. And I hope that I can do that for as long as possible and help um, young women grow and feel inspired to do whatever it is that they want to do on this earth. Thank you very much, and thank you all for attending.